Yes, you're seeing really all the teams now bringing up their sprinters. There are always at least three riders from each team, two of the domestiques with the sprinter sitting on their wheel. Uh, I'm sure if we could get a, a view from inside the peloton, which unfortunately you can't, you'd see some serious uh, uh, balking, um, not actually probably shoving, but really some some very, very close and tense, tense riding. These are always extremely tense and on the edge type of times. And uh, well, they're traveling at something around about 35 miles an hour. And the sprint they'll hit at uh, some 40 miles an hour. You look at these big, beautiful uh, bridges built here when they had in 1992, the World Fair at Sevilla, which brought people far and wide to this lovely city. And now we've got the Volta coming in to finish here. It's finished here many times in the past then. The last time we finished was 1981 when Lamatink was uh, here. And uh, the riders then looking to put their name on the victory roll of this race, the Volta, which dates back to 1935. This is the 50th Volta in the series. And who's going to get this stage in Sevilla? Very hot, baking condition, over 30 degrees. The riders then have been covering today some 162 kilometers are right that's over uh what's that three three uh, eight so 160 uh six uh, it's about, it's about 100 miles or so yeah miles so 100 miles they've been really rattling along here in these conditions now look at the psycho riders on the front trying their lot then for bartoli number 151 stretching this one there but the uh the gavis still very much in contention Yes, I think, you know, you're probably looking at that. They'd be doing an average speed of around 55 kilometres an hour here, just for those viewers who don't understand miles an hour, Dave. And, uh, you know, the sprint is, is run at uh, over 70 k's now, so uh, that's why it's so exciting. Is that two kilometres to They're the They're inside, finish? two to go now, and they still the psycho lads on the front. Then coming up from behind now, the uh, Gavis have only got one. Yes, two riders still in there. The red jersey on the far right-hand side. Looks like Vazeman's doing what he can to lead out Zabel of the uh, telecom team. It could be down to Zabel and Blylevans and Minali when they finally come through, but they're still long enough to pace. Jalabé is back in the main pack. He's but about to tenth from the front at the moment. Rock, uh, sitting quite comfortably, and they're looking for a gap to go through. Jalabé moves on the left-hand side. He's got quite a nice little gap at the moment. Vus goes on the right-hand side in the red. Vus nearly hits the man just inside him. Look about to six or seven back on the right-hand side. That's Vus in the red at the moment, trying to work his way through, but he's getting a bit barged right now. And still Minali in that little pack then in the middle. Blylevans in the yellow, lying about two, four, five, six back from the front as well so the sprinters are trying to come into good position and look like they might get boxed and still they're going flat out here on the front hammering down in toward the finish and they like to get boxed in if they're not careful some of those sprinters are in the midst of the pack they've got to fight their way out of this one this cause has one kilometer to go for them to have absolute judgment on the right position at the right time as some of the people have been sucked in the big bunch behind are able to come through now one or two people who don't have the sprint want to wind up from a long way out Blalevans is now well and truly in the center of this little pack and Jalabé is trying to keep out of harm's way and still on the front then flying away, it looks to me as if uh, uh, the Vust, sorry, it's uh, the Vaserman now pulls off the telecom rider, pulls off the front. But he discovered that he got a Gavis rider behind him, and it wasn't Zabel. Zabel's gone to the left hand side in the pink crash helmet. Zabel puts his head down and starts to go for this one. It's Zabel in the center, but on the left hand side, it looks to me that Vust is starting to go, and Zabel's had to go across him. Vust is now coming out the side. In fact, no, it's Alano, it's Alano, Alano for Mappe now. He's coming down the finishing straight, trying to get this uh, one and 12 seconds vital bonus. Alano is steaming down here. Is he going to get it then? Alano still know he's been overtaken on the line. Zabel. He's been absolutely sold out. Zabel. Alano now is struggling with Zabal. Hits the front of Minali is with him. Zabal still comes back, but Alano tries it. Zabal grows Zabel. the line again. And on the line it goes. Blyleven. Back to Blyleven's who came from nowhere. What a finish that was. They were going at it all the way through. And a hats off then to Super Alano who tried so hard to get that stage. And suddenly Blyleven's came from nowhere. He was sucked in the middle of that pack. If we take a top view of that group, at some point you'll see that Blyleven's was well in the middle. I thought he was uh, nicely contained in there and he wouldn't have a cut chance in hell. Watch him come through here, Stephen. And that was just phenomenal. You can see everyone's having a go. Oops, they've lost their legs, but Bly Levins has stayed in, tucked in right till the perfect moment, only less than 100 metres from the line. Um, he's got a sit from everyone else's work. His guys are up there working for him too, so... Let's look at that one then as Blylevans in the middle of your picture starts to come through off Manali's wheel. Zabel's beginning to die a thousand deaths and Zabel... Wust on the right had a good chance yeah. but he got boxed in. You can see him over right on the barriers. Blylevans has come through on the left in front of Manali by the looks of it. Chalabert stayed out of trouble back in about uh, 3, 9, 10th or 11th. Um, and that yeah. was really a, a very classic great sprint that was. Well, you've seen these men at work, they're specialists at this sort of thing, and we now take a view from the front as Jalabé hits the line then, 
and takes that one. Zabel could not get up to him at all. Yep, Minali. So, victory then going to Jalabert. Thumbs up to the TVM rider. Once again, it's all about timing, David. It's critical if you're at the front too early. You saw the telecom riders. You saw the telecom rider. He's come to the front too early. Um, Manali was in the front too early, but Bly Levens just has come through yeah. a fraction of a second later, and he's been the one. To and he's only what about 21, 22 years of age, isn't he? I know somebody was saying to me that uh, on the Tour de France that they reckon he's going to be one of the greatest sprinting talent we've seen for an awful long time. He's that, uh, really shown some. He's got some fantastic results in the short time he's been on the circuit, David. Uh, and I think we can look forward to really, really important things. Well, he took a couple of state victories in the Tour of Holland and took the leader's jersey in that, which was very much a sprinter's benefit early on. And he took, of course, that stage victory in the uh, in the Tour de France as well. That one's really made people sit up and take notes yeah. on when you win stages in the Tour de France against those uh, riders. Well, no and that's change great. overall. Chalabert's taken it really easy. Well, that's it then. Chalabert coming in the main group there as uh, Blalevens takes the stage. And that tomorrow will be the stage severe to Marbella, 187 kilometres. Uh, the riders there will be underway. We'll be on air at uh, 15.30. Hope you can join Stephen Hodge and myself for that stage. I think it might be down to a bit of a sprint as well, but the big hills aren't coming in to hit the mountain on the 14th of September. But there, Blalevens is a stage victor. Jalabert keeps the yellow jersey from Stephen Hodge and myself, David Duffield, on the Tour of Spain. Bye-bye. Also, in the um, sprints, uh, when he came into Arenza, he was just second behind uh, Laurence Jalabert, who showed Jalabert showed that he could also uh, sprint and climb by, by taking first place there. Went to Zamora, where we had that big crash. That one also went to Minali, ahead of Vust. In fact, they just repeated it here, Minali Vust, uh, in that particular order. And sight of Artiak was back in ninth spot. Looks like he got to third. I'm waiting for confirmation of that one. So he's been sprinting extremely quickly indeed, as the, as the young uh, specialist from the Gavis team who are still, by the way, trying to hang on to uh, uh, Rees, Bjorn Rees, who's out of the race, by the way. He dropped out yesterday, and he's got 21 days uh, when he's got to rest because of the uh, third vertebrae in his back that got cracked when he crashed in the time trial. Manali enjoying every moment of that. When he got screwed yesterday in the sprint finish when the TVM rider, I guess he was Saito, as I thought, got uh, the third spot. The uh, Russian champion just ahead of Zabel back in fourth, and it was Baffy into fifth spot. Um, Mr. Thousand Volts himself, uh, and those are your, your top sprinters, just, just uh, shaking the pack up a bit this time round. Yesterday, Blylevens won, Benali second. Uh, Tudenberg got into third spot, Vus was fourth, Sabel was in fifth, so you sort of uh, shake your, your, your pack and out comes a different uh, success each day. Now, looking at, across there, the, the Mediterranean, the rise will go virtually parallel to the sea tomorrow. They're going on what is going to be one of the toughest stages of the race, the stage 12 in the uh, in the Vuelta, and they're going to ride from Abaya to Sierra Nevada. Now, Sierra Nevada, the climb there is some, uh, what, uh, uh, 3,000, sorry, 2,320 metres above sea level, and we're not going to see much of Minali tomorrow when we get there, because um, it's a stinking big climb after they covered some 240 kilometres, and uh, he will be happy just to hang on in there and stay inside the time limit which will operate. There is Minali, still breathing from exertions. The Gavis Balan rider. I mean, Gavis have done some wonderful rides. They've got some tremendous characters in their, in their team. And uh, Gavis is an electrical switch gear company and uh, the Balan part of the operation actually makes uh, electrical doors, the automatic doors that go up and, uh, you know, you get automatic garage doors. It just shows the amazing sort of people that sponsor cycle racing, but of course, it's such big business in, uh, in Italy. And watch again then at that sprint. So you want something like this tomorrow, by the way, if you join us on Eurosport, I hope you'll come on air with us around about half past three Central European time, half past uh, uh, two back in the UK, because they will go over a climb uh, of a 1,060 metres above sea level after some 150 kilometres have been covered. A bit of a drop down into the valley to Granada, don't start singing, at 680 metres above sea level. And then we have this big climb up to the top of the Sierra Nevada. And that one is going to be some humdinger of a climb because they're going to be something like uh, 30 kilometres and most of it is up, up, up all the way. Well, if you didn't know where we were, you can see where it is now, that uh, great big sign on entering uh, this uh, great holiday resort. And maybe many of you people listening on Eurosport uh, and watching on Eurosport 
uh, familiar with this neck of the woods, but you can see all the modern buildings that are here that have sprung up because uh, this, this whole area around here wasn't that well uh, known until the 1930s, but it began to be developed as, as a holiday resort. And we've got groups of riders coming in here off the back. Just shows that those two third category climbs and the first category climb did uh, um, shell them out a little bit. And this is going to be the ceremony of the of the presentations of the jerseys to Lauren Shalibur. He's got just a hat full of jerseys now. We haven't been showing you these on Eurosport. We've been off air pretty quickly. They've come in early today. Most times we've been a bit late. But this is the mountain climbers jersey. And he's got that one, the white jersey. And he's got 106 uh, uh, points against uh, Roberto Pistorius, uh, 80 points. So there's no doubt about it. Jalibert is showing that he can climb as well as sprint. So Jalabert taking the white jersey yet again. Roberto Pistori in second spot, 80 points back. Yes, it's Kibbe in, in third spot. The uh, sprint jersey also uh, is on the shoulders of Laurent Jalabert. He's got 186 points against uh, Alano, who has 101 points. Minali back in third spot with 90. Well, uh, Minali will start to move up, I think, and seriously challenge Alano for the, the second spot in the sprints. And there we are. That's the confirmation of the uh, mounting competition I just told you about. Updated. Uh, in fact, not updated. Those, in fact, are the points as they were this morning. They just flashed up on your screen. But uh, the competition wouldn't have been changed very much because of the way in which the uh, two third category times were taken by the five uh, escapers so there he goes Shalabert now taking the uh, points jersey uh, and just one more jersey yet to come with that of the overall race leader sponsored here by the National Westminster Bank as you can see on his jersey and what happens of course he can't wear all three jerseys not he would get rather hot he wouldn't get the sponsors much uh, opportunity for this is going to hand it on down to the man who's second on the classification this is a phenomenal performance of Jalabert throughout this race when you think he started the season by uh, winning the Paranis he won the Milan San Remo as well and he went on uh, through the Tour de France to take the green points jersey uh, taking that wonderful stage at uh, Monde as well and by the way they say that uh, Jalabert is a bit like a revolving door he goes out of that door you see and then comes along the back of the the, uh, caravan and comes in the other one and they change his jersey a bit like the weather um, you know when they have the, 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 the weather vane um, with, with out of one door comes the man and out woman, with the other door comes the woman so he sort of comes out of one door goes in and comes out of the other one and gets a different jersey every time as well well they are talking about the 12 stage tomorrow from Marbella to Sierra Nevada 239 kilometers and that's a toughie that really is going to give a chance for the mountain climbers to cut back as we see there the uh, sprint jersey for the intermediate sprint still on the shoulder of Baserman. But tomorrow Pantani will lie 22nd over on classification, 15 minutes and 18 seconds down. Now recovering from his bronchitis, would like to move up the general classification. Another mountain climber, Ugramov, 23rd on GC, 15 minutes and 34 seconds down, might move up. But also have to watch tomorrow as Lauren Jalabert takes on that yellow jersey. A threat from Richard Veron. Richard Veron from the Festina team is 8 minutes and 46 seconds down. It may seem a lot. We know Jalabert can climb, but tomorrow we could well find that many of those mountain climbers will start to attack uh, and go away. And Jalabert and his on team are going to be very, very vigilant tomorrow. Keep the thing together until they get to the last big climb of the day. And I hope that you'll join myself, David Duffield, on Eurosport to, to see the action tomorrow because many of those top mountain climbers waiting for the big day to close up on uh, Lawrence Jalabert. We'll have their moment uh, tomorrow and we'll know as we go out of the stage tomorrow who, when we get to the uh, Pyrenees, might well have been with a shout. Jalabert then has been so strong so far, but it's going to be very, very interesting tomorrow. So do join us then but for now. Bye-bye. At that one. Just six kilometres left to go as far as he's concerned. And he's climbing each kilometre. I've just done a time check. It's taking him two minutes and 23 seconds per kilometre. So he's got, what, uh, two... That's 12, uh, two, six, it's 40. So he's got about another 14 minutes to go to get this stage victory. And if only he can just hang on in there, provided he doesn't blow and grovel. We saw how Montoya, uh, when the bunch caught him, just went woof, straight out the back, as if he'd been sort of glued to the tarmac by super glue. And that can happen to you if all the strength goes out of your legs. Let's hope it doesn't happen to this fellow here, because he, he really deserves, in my opinion, this, this stage victory today. And I don't think anybody listening to this would, would, um, would disagree with that. When you go away with 45 kilometres of the race under your belt, and you ride off, you get six men chasing you, persist with your attack, you keep going, over the first category climb of the day. He went over there after 163 kilometres being covered uh, in the lead, and he just persisted and stayed on in there. 
all the way through uh, Bert Dietz and now the the group realise they've got to do something terrific here if they're going to try and catch him. Keep your fingers crossed for that uh, that lad who really has performed well today and given us uh, something to talk about. Uh, Brunel on the general classification lying in third spot. The gap showing you here back on the road to the chasing group for our leader. And I'm looking to see if any more of the fast bit are likely to try and jump around. Yes, somebody's got away on the right-hand side, jumped across, I thought it might happen, and go with the time check back then at 7 kilometres of 4 minutes and 13 seconds. They've uh, knocked another minute or so out of him, uh, but uh, so, still the chance that he can stay away. They can't see that they're going to pull back 4 minutes in 7 kilometres. But it might still happen. What about you watching this programme back at home? But I'm almost urging him on. Go on, go on. Five kilometres to go. Uh, Ziartek Rado jumped away over. That's uh, Dano uh, Clavero, who, who zoomed off across to uh, try and catch up with... Uh, our leader, let's see if he's going to be allowed to have a, a little bit of a, a leeway, but I don't think he's going to stay out there very long. You can see he's also beginning to struggle just a bit. Oh. Oh. Clavero just about 20 metres off the front. Just had one success last year in the, uh, the tour of uh, Crenshaw. He's been pulled back in again here. Had a third place in the tour of the Rioja region last year. Looking to try and get to the second spot today, but it's not going to be. down a bit now it looks to me as if he might be inside he is dying that gap certainly has come down for Dietz they might still still catch him oh he's struggling now he is beginning to struggle getting so close to the finish of this stage. And before long, the bunch might well see him up the road ahead of them. This man who set off with 45 kilometers of the race covered is counting down the kilometers. His maximum lead on the main group at one time was well over 10 minutes. Chasing groups got to within uh, five or six minutes of him, but now with four kilometres to go, he really is struggling. We see there in the distance the road he has got to climb, and if the cameras go round and down the hill, you'll see where he's come from. 27 kilometres continually uphill. And all of it at the end of what has been a very hard stage. He's already been over the uh, uh, Caparamonte as well. That was 1,270 metres above sea level. He had to climb 1,000 metres up the top of that climb. And that was all in a distance of some 24 kilometres. Down the other side, swept along the valley, into Granada.
Yep, I thought the gap had come down then. 3.27 it is. He's still one kilometre ahead of them, though, because... Uh, it's coming down, but he may, may, may still get it. And the damage is being done, they're flying out the back. But some of us think they're just not quite going fast enough at the moment. In five kilometres of cut back, over three minutes, they've got to go a lot faster than this, I think. And they'll all begin to struggle with the pace of the Onse team up in front. Quick look there at... Uh, Yoda Gonzalez, number 44, drifting off the back now for the uh, Gavis team. That's uh, Brignoli, the Italian have been climbing quite well. And the damage is being done by the speed they're going to try and catch this man, who's still soldiering on. What a way to enter your professional career then for Bert Deans up there to come from the amateur ranks when he's German amateur champion in 1993 to now be setting the pace in the Tour of Spain like he's doing here. This really is sort of storybook stuff, isn't it? But he's rocking and he's rocking. Oh! See how he's rocking now, looking at the banners. Well, it's three to go. I should think the chasing group are probably just round about the four kilometre to go point. So it still should be possible for him to stay away. The group has really been cut down. Axel Merckx is just in there, I can see him. Also in there for Artyakis Garcia Spani, but the uh, lone rider has still got to lead about three and a bit minutes. Artyak quite well represented back in this little group by the number 12, uh, Garcia Casas, uh, number 13 in the group, uh, Garcia Spania, and looks like number 16 in there, uh, Manuel Pascali. There, very close to your, your film at the moment, and you can see the motor roller rider, uh, Axel Merckx, the son of that very famous uh, Eddie Merckx, rocking away there, number 115, big, tall, lanky figure is too. And we're very pleased with his performance so far in the, uh, in the tour. He's in the top uh, 15 or so, 12th on general classification, as Bert Dietz getting closer and closer to the finish now. It looks like he's going to make it. This has been real courage all the way through. I know what somebody's doing there, showing a picture of a lady out of <laughs> to encourage him with, with pin-up girls now as well. Another fighter pilot used to stick them in their windows and put them above their beds to make them think of their girlfriends back at home. But uh, Bert Deeds here, what he's got to do, he just hopes that he can hang on in and it's just his legs don't give out him and we wish they don't either. Come on, Bert, keep going. Now, I think he's got it now on that time check. So there we are. It's 2.14, they've got three commutes to go. And look how it's splitting still. But I'm surprised that none of the real mountain specialists have tried to put the pressure on here. Perhaps they're all suffering because this has been a, a very hard tour run off at a great rate of knots and uh, he's inside two they're inside three so in fact there's less than a kilometer separating them now 
At one time when he came up the hill, I remember there was like five kilometers separating them. So they've got within one kilometer of him. He's got two to go. They've got less than one to catch him. So they've got to go nearly twice as fast as he's going. So the chances are he can still hang on in there. He's going to call for a real sheer burst of speed from that group to pull him back. They'll probably have him in sight on the long straight stretches. Pantani there in the white jersey of Carrera. Still lying fourth or fifth back to the front. He's not made any attempt to go so far. De La Santa over on the left-hand side for Mappe. He's still in there too. Neil Stevens is really going some. In the background, you can see the ski resort packed with holidaymakers during the winter months. Now the sun beating down on the Spanish spectators who have come out here way ahead of the race before the road was closed off to make sure that they could see their heroes in action. Oh, you can see he's oh, oh, he can hardly ride straight. He looked down, he's just desperately hanging on here. And they're coming up like a real train. The speed, the way the Ansees are driving up here. But it's splitting. Well, Jalabert's gone away from this one. And I wonder whether it's just a tactical move, but Jalabert's just rocketed off the front here. In fact, no, he did his lean out of the bottom, to my mistake. It was a little white hat, I just saw it coming up at it, but Jalabert's just behind this one. And he's got one kilometer to go just there. Approaching that one kilometre to go, and he's still rocking. And in fact, uh, it looked like Leonardo Aparuccia that was going off the front of the chasing group with the with the onsays there to try and pull this man back. We'll have to wait and see who's doing the damage. The race is on then for this stage victory. Yes, it's been like that ever since the uh, the flag dropped this morning at the start. And it is Shalabert. I thought I thought it looked like him coming off the front then to try and uh, go away from the rest of the contenders. It is Jalabert that uh, came away. I'm not quite sure whether he's all that concerned to rip the legs off the people that are following or just, just did that to tactically show the, the specialist climbers that he's still able to control them. And it looks like another one's going on the right-hand side. Here, Pantana has been... Sh Shot off, Pantani's come up, and there is a kilometre to go sign as well for the chasers. My watch is now running, and it's what 42 seconds to go as Brunel is beginning to drive up on the front. De La Sandra is behind him, Jalabé is in there at the moment. Pantana is being blown out the back of this one as Jalabé moves across the right hand side. De La Santa also now, Jalabé moves across, and that is now 56 seconds separates Jalabé from our lone leader, Bert Dies. That is very, very little indeed the way in which Jalabé is coming up now, racing after the figure of Bert Dietz up there on the skyline. He'll be able to see him now, the telecom rider. Closing up towards the back end, and less than a minute separating him from Jalabert, who's riding after him, looking for another stage victory. What a brilliant ride by Jalabert. Whether he gets Dietz or not, he will certainly have shown the people who are trying to threaten him in the mountains that he is still the boss. Pantani got blown out, but Onk has not been able to attack either. Alano, who's lying second on GC, could do nothing about the way in which he rode off the front. And this is Bert Dietz, who went away 45 kilometres from the start. 190 odd kilometres he's been in there. And Jalabert can see him now. Jalabert can see Bert Dietz has been out there now for 190 odd kilometres. And he's going for him. Abra Milano here, number eight, can't hold the pace either. Lying second on GC, he's just lost Jalabert's wheel, and Jalabert can see Dietz. The, oh, the effort on this man's foot. And look at Dietz clawing his way up the climb. Everybody urging him on. 193 kilometers, and it looks like Jalabert is going to get him. Oh, come on. Oh, he's got to go! He's out of the saddle now! He's got to go! And Jalabert is just riding up to him.
Supreme Smooth Silas, and they're in the few hundred metres of the finish now. And Dietz is really grovelling. And Jalabert looks back to see where those have gone. They're inside 150 metres, and Jalabert is closing on his man. The food flotilla of motor cars in front. Blocking our view as the rest come up to him. And Jalabert looks back over his shoulder, and Dietz is digging down, and he's trying to launch himself. He's sprinting now. He's dying on his bike. Jalabert is coming up to him. He's dying on the bike. Dietz is just there crossing the line and on the line I wouldn't like to separate those two as Dietz just goes completely into oblivion on the line and Jalabert closed up on him. We'll have to have a photo finish of that one to see if Bert Dietz, the hero of this stage, finally got the stage into Severinada and he's right out on his bike. The sheer courage of that telecom rider. Right at the last gasp, he had Jalabé with him. And we're going to wait for the official confirmation of the result. I was just looking at the camera shot then, and uh, yeah, here's Pantana. It just shows you that acceleration, that final kilometre, how far back he was. He was with them with about, uh, what, three kilometres to go and just blew. I, I tell you how these people in the last uh, few kilometres can, can, uh, can collapse. Uh, Eddie Merck's uh, son, Axel, just come across the line as well. There's been a lot of people in those final three kilometres on that sheer speed of the Onsei team that have suffered. So Dietz, I believe, has got that stage, just waiting for confirmation on our side uh, view. But the rest of the riders coming in here some very, very tired men indeed. And they're desperately going, I think, to uh, want to struggle further back down the mountain to come inside the time limit. And yet, here's Neil Stevens coming in now, you see, and uh, how much work he was doing further down the, the, uh, the, the climb just shows you, doesn't it? That for two minutes and 15 seconds or so, Neil, Neil's just lost on Jalabur. He was right with him till about two kilometers ago. That just shows you how fast they came up that climb. Six hours, 52 minutes and 20 seconds of racing for the stage of the tour, which is the first big one we've had in the mound. We look back then at Bert Dietz coming up here, really burying himself on the line. Jalabert up alongside him, thankful that he'd seen off Alano and the rest of the people going for the crowd. But it's Bert Dietz who just rolled over the line about half a wheel ahead of Jalabert to take his first big major professional success. Uh, Jalabert coming over in second spot, still preserving that yellow jersey as overall race leader because the top men just could not catch him today. Alano is on uh, Jalabert's left-hand side. He closed up towards the end, Alano, but he didn't get any more time at all. We're looking back again here on the side view as Jalabert looks to see what's happened with Alano and then out of the side. They always say, come on, boys, sprint for me at the line. He caught him there and Dietz, who suddenly knew he got a problem, began to go and that's a lovely sight, isn't it? The Jalabert looked back to say, come on, it's a sprint between you and me, and then Dietz goes through, and after what, some 194, 193 kilometers out there on the own, Jalabé, in fact, from this view, just sat back and let the German take the stage. That's a very gentlemanly sign indeed, and Dietz then actually grovels the line, and he got the stage victory. Hats off, I think, to uh, Jalabé, to Chapeau, for letting the man come through there, because uh, he really said, come on, you have this stage, and Jalabé just proved to everybody else that he was still the boss of the tour of uh, Spain. So tomorrow then we're going on up there to Mercia, 181 kilometers of riding. They go off this mountain, down the slopes uh, to the uh, stage town for the start for tomorrow. And that stage at 181 uh, kilometers.
second meet is a fairly flattish stage. We look back then at Alano trying to close the gap on the left hand side of Jalabu. Looks so uh, comfortable indeed, but certainly Jalabu is still in yellow. Deeds the victor today. Oh, coming up next on Eurosport will be the uh, uh, Paris Brussels, uh, and that is going to be a major classic that we bring you on Eurosport. Myself, David Duffield, and the Tour of Spain people say bye bye to you now. But riders, those that escaped around the 45 kilometre mark, there was 181 ahead of the riders at the start from Uloda del Rio, heading for Mercia. Well, the five riders, the two Spaniards, Rodriguez and Jose Manuel Rodriguez and Rodriguez, Jose Rodriguez, I beg your pardon. The Frenchman Pascal Hervé, Christian Hen, the German, and Eros Pauli. Well, their lead over the peloton was around 10 minutes. The peloton weren't particularly bothered, as it was that the only man posing a threat was Manuel Rodriguez of Spain. He was 28 minutes down on the leaders. So the peloton were taking it easy. And so, as we mentioned earlier, it became something of a game of cat and mouse right at the death. Nobody really wanting to start the sprint off. And the question was, who would it be at the end? In the end, it was Christian Hen. 31 years of age, the first big win of his entire career, absolutely delighted. He's always been extremely unlucky, finished second in the Paris Tour 93, and he's done that on so many occasions. <laughs> it really was something of a watershed for the chap. Christian Hen then taking it for Telecom and Germany, but Jalabert comfortably leading overall. And their confirmation, those five riders, they just went for it, covering over 100 kilometers, all on their lonesome today. The nearest to them, over nine minutes adrift. So a nice result for Christian Hen, but Laurent Jalabert staying clear. Five minutes, 18 seconds clear of his nearest rival. Currently posted the Frenchman on 60 hours, 31 minutes, 24 seconds. And of course the Tour de l'Avenir going on, Magnet underlining his status to final big uh, and they got I think would like set up for for, for Baffe Bradolano. And yeah, Mappe on the front at the moment. Adriano Baffe will be looking for a good lead out. The yellow jerseys of the Once Radas. Jalabert, of course, can sprint, but I don't think he wants really to, as Stephen Hodge was saying the other day, he's a bit more careful now in these sprints. He won't go through when these real sprinters will just actually put their elbows around each other, lean on each other. They just, they just obviously couldn't care less. They get a bit uh, uh, physical in the sprints, not deliberately to, to upend somebody, but they push and shove and uh, go through a little hole that may not be there, whereas Jalabert is probably a little more circumspect since that crash at uh, Armentier and won't like to be mixing it with him until he can see a gap to go for. Yes, Telecom are on the front now then at the moment. Setting it up then for Zabel. Or Vaserman in the red jersey. This is going to be a humdingy sprint yet again. That long string with the yellow jersey in the centre wrapped round Jalabert. Keeping out of harm's way. Whilst up in front, it's a long old ride in, and one or two of the chaps have got very, very tired legs. When you think they've been racing now for something like eight months of the year, and some of them, in fact, uh, uh, Christian Hen had been down riding in the uh, Sun Tour uh, in Australia last October, where he had a success down there as well. So some have a very, very long season indeed. And with the race now having come 2,301 kilometres since uh, we set out some 14 days ago, that's around about uh, 1,400 miles of racing. So there's a lot of very tired legs in here, but they're still working hard. Telecom on the front, but the Gavis have moved up. Gavis going again for a long one from way out. Oh, Telecom are blown here. One kilometre to go, they've got a, a bit of a left-hander, and then after that, a sweeping left-hander ahead of them. Here we go, this is a sharp left-hander, plenty of space to get round. Then a sweeping left-hander, which shouldn't cause them any trouble. 
And still Telecom have got a couple of minutes. Minali's still in there at the moment, though, despite what the problems they said. He got unvust in the red jersey. He's hovering. Telecom and Uxifus and Vaseman are both in there. Two red jerseys together for the Telecom team. Vaseman in the red. Vust is also in there at the moment. And swinging across the far side. Pantani of all sorts is going. Pantani on the right hand side. Surely he can't get round this lot. Pantani, the little climber, is trying to have a go to get himself a stage victory here. And on the left hand side looks like Jeska Skibby is coming up for a long one. Looks like TBM are going for a long one. Slightly uphill it could suit him as Manali goes to the line now. Vust is on his right hand side as well. Hitting the one on the line now. Athis gone to Vust. Vust has got it, but Zabel was in second spot. Alana was probably third on the left hand side. He burst through there, but. Um, Zabel was also in there, but I think he got second. Have to watch for that one again on the slow motion replay because I rather think Alana was quite close at the end. Let's have a go at that one again. I say punch on the right hand side, the devil's <laughs> trying to get away over there. Not a catch chance in hell with this lump, this big lump of muscle in the centre. Minali and then on the right. Vust. Vust goes for it. Gets it. Yeah, Zabel got second, I reckon. He was ever so closer. And Jalabert was in there too. Jalabert on from the top here. Bus comes through in the red. Watch this jersey. Bus is there, and Zabel is on his wheel. Benali is blown. Baff is struggling. Jalabe is in fourth. Yep, that's it. So Zabel got second, and so close then for the Germans, the telecom team nearly got a triple, nearly got three on the six, uh, in succession. Yeah, well, that's first there is uh, Zabel and Minali on the far side, Jalabe in fourth spot. Let's look at that one again as Minali runs out of steam and Vus comes by. Actually, Jalabert also got Alana for company. I saw him come up um, through this little group. Alana's got a reddish coloured jersey too. It's a maroon one. He's on the left-hand side now with his elbow all bandaged up. He hides himself behind Jalabert. Bus comes through. Zabel on the right-hand side. Minali through there. Then it's Jalabert in the yellow. And just a further on the left-hand side was uh, Alano. But no bonuses then for Jalabert and Alano. The bonuses went to the first three across the line, but they won't affect the overall position at the moment. Jalabert having started out with a lead of 5 minutes and 18 seconds on uh, Alano. His teammate Brunel this morning in general classification for Jalabert was in, uh, in third spot on GC at uh, 6 minutes and uh, 35 seconds. Uh, Melchior Maori, his teammate, is in fourth spot this morning. Roberto Pistori in fifth and uh, Bartoli sixth, Richard Veronk in seventh spot. Well, whilst we're here in, in Valencia, this um, third largest town in Spain, you could see the uh, route they, they took today, uh, a bit hilly, but tomorrow then we're going to have this uh, stage at um, Barcelona. And uh, tomorrow then, these laps of the circuit, and uh, next we're going to have uh, off-road motorcycling for you. Bit of a change from uh, the Tour of Spain, where they've been thundering along great rate of knots here in the sunshine today. But tomorrow, do join us for this uh, Barcelona circuit, which I think uh, is at half past two. We're on air, and uh, we hope you'll join us on that occasion. For up the Montjuic uh, climb is is quite a tough one too. So uh, that's one to look forward to tomorrow, and then we have a day's rest on the Monday. I'm sure these riders be only too happy to get uh, time to uh, to relax and recover from what has been an extremely uh, hard tour. As far they're concerned. So Jalabo still has his hands on all three jerseys, uh, opening up a shop, I should think, by the time he gets to. They said, in fact, he's, when he opens his, his case when he goes in the hotel, it's a bit like an Aladdin's cave with so many jerseys in there that um, that he's got. Uh, the uh, stage 15 then coming up tomorrow and. Uh,
We hope you join our Eurosport team on the Tour of Spain. As we're bringing, of course, the best in bike racing, not only the Tour of Spain, but we're going on then into the World Championship in Colombia. So a lot of bike racing ahead. So I hope that you'll join us tomorrow on that Sunday afternoon. Myself, David Duffy, we've seen yet another scintillating sprint, but tomorrow something shall be splattered all over the place. See you then. Look at that. No sooner we slam up the... And, and Gianetti is with... Jalabert, Jalabert powering up this climb. Just got the Archek man just in front of him. I think he wants today's stage victory, does Jalabert. And he's looking very, very good indeed. They've opened up quite a sizable gap here. And in fact, it isn't uh, Giannetti. It's one of the Seiko rides that's come across here. And that could be Bartoli. Yes, it is. Michel Bartoli leading Jalabert at the moment, and I think that's, uh, yep, Veronk has come across too. They've got the Archek rod and pulled him back in. Bartoli looks back, sees Jalabert on his wheel, and uh, Veronk has come up to them. These, uh, that's it, that, the lid must have gone on the race now. I can't see that anybody back there can come across this gap. There's some really good, talented riders in this breakaway group here now with Jalabert in the yellow jersey, unless, of course, he starts easing back, but then surely somebody has to have a go at him. Jalabert in a good spot here, being fourth in line. Bartoli looks back, sees the Rodriguez coming through. Veronk is in there, too, in the blue jersey. Rodriguez persists with it, Veronk comes through. Both these riders, Veronk and Jalabert, on the French selections for the World Championships, but uh, Veronk said he doesn't want to go. He's worried about the uh, safety out there. Jalabert says he doesn't want to go because he's had a very long, hard season since he started way back, winning the Pyrenees, then going on to win the Milan San Remo. Also, by the way, Jalabert has uh, got some uh, uh, very secretive... Uh, um, support here because he's been getting threats since the problems with the uh, nuclear testing out in the Pacific uh, which Jacques Chirac has, uh, has started uh, uh, Laurent uh, uh, Jalabert here has had some, some threats as well so there's surreptitious police support actually to make sure that uh, he, he doesn't get, I think it's probably just somebody having a go but uh, you just imagine that in bike racing you're getting threats when you're wearing the yellow jersey when it's something to do with, uh, with somebody exploding bombs, it's, it's a strange old world we live in today doesn't it but uh, uh, there we are, Montoya trying to go across this gap. He's a diddy little fellow, I don't think he's got the speed to do it. And still out there in front, it looks like Bartoli is riding away off the, off the front of these two. Bartoli it is, is beginning to stretch his legs here and make the rest of them hurt. Joseph Montoya coming up here. The diddy little fellow in the uh, national colours of uh, Spain as their champion. As Bartoli looks back to see what damage he's done. Then Veron comes after him. They've caught him. And the, probably the best sprinter out of this little lot here, though, is undoubtedly Laurent Jalabert. So that's why Bartoli is trying to get away from him. Veronk, I think you will also recognise he can't out-sprint him. And, oh, they've got up to him now as Montoya switches on the far side. I didn't think they'd get caught then, but Serrano is also there from the Calme team. What a great race this is. Oh, he's gone! Montoya, cut him. he went straight through. <laughs> I didn't see him go on the other side at all. And uh, now then, he tried so hard on the Sierra Nevada climb, did uh, Montoya. This 31-year-old from the Bonesto team, who's uh, their team captain in the race. He was leading in the Volta in 1992, right until the penultimate time trial when uh, Tony Romiga rode on to his first victory. And now he's looking to try and get this one. Nobody seems to want to chase this one, and he could have timed it just to perfection, Montoya. Yep, Rodriguez is going to have a go. Then Jalabert goes after him. Oh, this is great stuff. They've been riding now the thick end of 150 kilometres. That's over 90 miles, and here they are. Blasting away at each other, one kilometre to go, Montoya leads under the uh, kites, then uh, Veronk, then Jalabert, Montoya 
hanging on for Grim Death here, just trying to get away, and suddenly the attack comes from Jalabeau, steam rolls away, he flits across the other side of the road to make sure that Ronk was not on his wheel, and he's gone away, in fact, the Artek rider Rodriguez is the only one trying to cut him back now, as Jalabeau looks like he's riding in to yet another stage victory. He scored seven victories last year in the Tour of Spain, and now he's coming up here, well, reminds me of the days when... Uh, uh, Freddie Martins won something like 12 stage victories in the Tour of Spain, but uh, Jalabert here is winning them on the mountains, winning them uh, on the uh, flat, and now Jalabert is riding away here. Tremendous performance by Jalabert. On to what is going to be probably what his 61st success of his career. If he can just stay away from this chasing group of three here, Rodriguez leads him, he looks back down the road here. He's lying second on the UCI classification of world uh, points at the moment, and if he does the Tour of Spain so well as this, with stage victories and the overall victory, he might well move up and go into lead on the classification of the uh, uh, UCI best riders in the world. Jalabert then, thundering on in here, what a tremendous uh, tour he's had so far. He's got another victory coming up here. Jalabert has just shown he is the boss, and he's done it in the finest possible way. Takes yet another victory here. Jalabert across the line in first spot, Sprint coming up for second spot Montoya might just about get it, ahead of Bartoli, Rodriguez into third and behind here comes a Veronk just over the line ahead of Serrano for the Calme team, Jalabert that gives him his fourth stage victory in the uh, tour and the rest of the round is coming, that's Pistori in the white jersey second on the King of Mountains competition, Olano's just finished, uh, just behind Pistori and the rest of the round is trickling in here just shows you on that final lap the destruction that was created by Jalabert pulling back the leaders and doing his own attacking and the gap here the screen up there on the left hand side 45 uh, seconds showing that really has pushed a lot of riders back down the old GC but uh, the man who's lying second on the classification overall, Alano, came in. That gives it isn't quite as steep as that, by the way. It looks like dragon's teeth, doesn't it? Or crocodile teeth or something. But <laughs> Jalabert, who rides in to his fourth victory in the uh, tour this year. What a brilliant performance. And when you imagine that he also was sick, he had that stomach trouble. There was a picture in uh, El Pais, the Spanish newspaper, of uh, uh, three riders who'd been into the hedge to tend to the needs of nature, and Jalabo was one of those. He was off his bike three or four times when the spaghetti bolognese gave him all the old uh, Montezuma's uh, uh, toilet two set, but he recovered from that. He's come back with a bang. He's won the stage in Barcelona. He really is dominating this race this year. What a great ride. Brilliant. So this man will be up on the victory rostrum not only to get his white jersey, his uh, yellow jersey and his maroon jersey leading on the uh, overall, the King of the Mountains and the points, but also a victor today on the stage as well. And on the podium, they've got two doors on the right-hand side, left-hand side of the podium, and he comes in one side, out the other, a bit like a, a revolving door at a hotel, and they quickly keep changing his jerseys and coming back out again. Jalabert is doing a brilliant ride today, and I know he's getting tremendous tremendous support, he speaks fluent Spanish, the Spaniards love him because when he finishes, he doesn't have a ride of sulks and goes off to his hotel, he signs the autographs, he has his photograph taken with the kids, he says hello to the mums and dads too, and Laurent Jalabert is showing not only is a grand champion winning bike racing fine star, but he's all a great bloke too, and everybody down in Spain is loving this fellow for the Anse team, who has just won the stage in Barcelona. Well, we won't be on air tomorrow with the uh, racing live, we're coming back on Tuesday, and I hope you'll join Robert Miller and my myself, David Duffield, for the next stage in the Tour of Spain. Alex Zuller riding up this climb, which will take him possibly to a stage victory here in the uh, Tour of Spain. He's come back, as I say, almost from the dead. He was one of those riders who had that stomach trouble with the spaghetti bolognese. He took a right pacing in the Sierra Nevada. He's through the eight-kilometre point. This man, Axel Merckx, chasing after him, going very well indeed. Uh, long, stringing sort of legs. What sort of fellow is he like, Axel Merckx, uh, Robert? Well, uh, funnily enough, I always thought he was like a glass of milk uh, because he's, like, really long and wide. And, uh, 
up until this year and until he put up some decent performances uh, recently he's not been very strong so like uh, it's a bit like a glass of milk really there's not much in it <laughs> no fears at this moment well he's starting to no try problems there <laughs> well he's going to go after another fellow this this other long tall chap isn't he so he's got yeah. two two tall chaps out on the attack so probably fired with enthusiasm axel merck to his his father's on the race at the moment uh, because it must be a terrible job to live up to the reputation of your father won over 500 races. And that's we're talking Axel Merckx, by the way, not uh, Zula here. Uh, and uh, Zula fighting back, I'd say, from his problems he had so far in the race. Last time check, we had around about 3 minutes 58, and they're coming through the uh, little place of uh, uh, Bacrera, and there are the gaps between Zula, Merckx, and the peloton. He's not your average mountain climber, this fellow, is he? Which one? <laughs> Silver. <laughs> Silver. Oh, he's not very heavy and uh, very talented guy. I think as we saw in this year's Tour de France. Yeah, he really did. He's, yep. he's not looking as, as fluid as he normally is, but uh, he's been having a difficult time recently, so uh, he's probably not as, as fresh as he should be. And he's one of the few tall people that could get up the big mountain. He's got seven kilometres to go now. The rest are uh, getting up to, well, I suppose, about the nine kilometre point. So three and a bit minutes, Robert. You've been up these mountains before. What's that sort of lead like with the specialists behind him? On a hill like this, it's, it's, if, if he cracks, it's not enough. But uh, the only guys who, are going to, like, who can only close that gap down are Jalabert and Brunel, and they, they're from the same team, so they're not going to chase. And the other guys who are back in the, in the main group there, they, they won't want to chase because they're probably defending their position or trying to save some energy for tomorrow. Well, last time we were up this climb in 1992, it was Anzaga that took first place, Farfan was second, and Farfan's out of the race now at the moment. Zilla was third that day, so he's looking to go at least two places better. Brunel, that Robert was talking about, was in fourth spot. Cubino was fifth, and Robert Miller and Steve Rose both came in at the same time, and that was the day when, when Maori, who'd been the previous year's winner of the Tour of Spain, uh, lost some three minutes, and Romiger came in sixth spot, all in the same group as, as Robert and, uh, and Stephen Roche. But it was snowing that time, somewhat different conditions today. Yeah, there was a little bit of, a, like, grizzly hailstones coming down just as we came into the little village that you saw there. Uh, it's a bit of a shock here when you've been sweating on the way up to come down in, uh, like, hailstones. And they had snow as well in 1991 uh, when they came from Andorra to Plalabelle. In fact, they cancelled the stage that day because on the day before, uh, it was uh, from Lale Damal to Andorra, there was snow, so they decided not to go to the top. So at least uh, the riders now know we're not going to get caught in a snowstorm. We had one in the Tour of Spain this year when they had the avalanche and had to stop the race as well. But some better conditions. Jalaba looking extremely uh, calm and collected here, riding up behind Brunil. And the onset team again demonstrating that enormous strength. Because look at the size of that gap. There's, there's a load of good blokes off the back there at the moment. And the, the pace that uh, is it Rincon here is, is setting. Uh, I don't think anybody will be complaining with this. They can see it's strung up pretty, pretty quickly. And uh, only Jalabert sitting there looking comfortable. So Zola with five kilometres to go. I'm uh, sorry, six. And the last time check, say just over three minutes. And Axel Merckx trying his hand at getting away. I was mentioning about the, the conditions at some of these uh, ski resorts. Uh, you, you, know, you end up staying in chalets sometimes. Not bad accommodation, but uh, it sometimes can be a bit frugal. And uh, that's one of the things over the years you've been riding, uh, Robert, uh, the change in, in accommodation for riders. Yeah, no, normally when you come in, the, in a region like this, it's pretty basic. You can't expect to uh, have a TV or a telephone in the room. And, uh, you might be lucky if you get hot water too some days. <laughs> You're telling me, when we were up and out towards, I couldn't make that damn thing work. It was all, all stone cold uh, water that day. I think it was a switch. I had to sort of put 10 francs in or something to make it work. I couldn't find the damn thing. It was dark by then anyway. Yeah, sometimes in these places that you haven't got money for the meter, you don't get anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was it. Now, it's all frugal conditions, by the way. We, we've been reading a lot about the problems out in Colombia. Robert went out there to, to ride earlier on this, this season uh, on, the, on the road race, and we understand the track, although they finished it off, it's a bit slippy on the surface, and the facilities round about aren't, uh, aren't particularly good. Are, are you upset at all, Robert, about not going to Colombia? I wasn't looking forward to going back. I would have went because uh, the team would have, would have sent me. But uh, I've been there three times, and I know what it's like. It's a totally different world, and you've got to... You've got to see it to believe what it's like, but it's not a place that you, uh, I'd want to go for <laughs> to do any serious work. 
And what about the problems with the food out there? We've had some problems in the tour so far. That uh, Spanish Tommy that hit 40 riders uh, on that particular day. And uh, Colombia, I suppose, at the hotels have got to really put themselves out on the occasion of the World Championships. I don't think... The, the thing is that they haven't got the basic materials to work with, so then uh, they can't really do a lot with it. They don't, they don't have... The, it's not the same standards as, as Europe. Then uh, you've got to accept it's a third world country, really. Well, some of these riders you're watching here, uh, Jalabert said he doesn't really want to go. Bronk is worried about his safety because uh, it appears that people get shot out there as well. And so he doesn't want to go, but they, they pick both of them for the French team. It sounds like Bjorn's already looking for his excuse. <laughs> Guess it's going to be a bit of a tough climb that one. What is that climb like in the, on the Tirama circuit? Well, when, when we did the circuit in the, um, in the race in March, the, we didn't do all of the hill, we only did about one kilometre of it. And uh, none of the European guys managed to get over the hill one time in the, in the group, in the main group. And that was only like, and the, the level of the racing wasn't really very high, not that it's going to be the World Championships. So uh, I think unless you go there uh, first, a very long time beforehand, you won't be adapted to the, the conditions you're going to meet there. Well, I think in the Colombian Championship held about three weeks ago, there were about 41 starters and only about 10 finishers, and they were all Colombian, so they should on the same course, by the way. So that says a lot, I suppose, about the, uh, the toughness of the course and the altitude as well. We're looking here at a little attack to try and get away up there. It's uh, Garcia Casas from the Artiac team, who's always been one of the prepared to have a go. The Artiac a team we don't normally see on Eurosports have been fairly uh, lively in this race because, of course, being a Spanish-based team, they wish to show their sponsors what it's all about, and we've seen them on the go every day so far. And out in front, Zulip is there. Uh, Axel Merckx has been trying his hand to get away as well, but uh, this long train of yellow jerseys, so familiar day in, day out, they've been all conquering and so tremendously strong that um, nobody has been able to get far away. The white jersey still perched in there, Robert the Pistori, one of the new uh, kids on the block because a lot of new talent coming through into the sport at the moment. And in fact, Jalaba is quoted as saying that uh, he's now happy to be riding in this particular race with people of his own generation, uh, Robert, because obviously when he goes to the Tour de France, there are riders a lot older than him who have been around a lot longer, but he seems to be more with riders of his own generation in this particular race, which must bode rather well for the future for him. And what do you think his chances, you know, in something like the Tour de France? Well now, well, now he has a chance to assess himself against the guys that he's going to be racing with seriously you know, like in the next couple, over the next couple of years. So if he feels comfortable racing these guys and he's better than them, then he, he does stand a chance of, uh, of improving for his Tour de France. So there we are. That's uh, the great man himself in the Motorola car. We just looked at Eddie Merckx now, came up to Axel Merckx, his son, to uh, give him a bit of a encouragement along the way. So Axel Merckx getting the encouragement from his father. I, I can't think. There are obviously many uh, father and son combinations over the years in cycling, but uh, a grand champion like Eddie Merckx uh, having a chance to, uh, to chat to his son on the way up here, looking for probably a second uh, place on the climb. But I somehow think that the big bunch can explode and they might well pull him back. And Axel now is beginning to struggle just a little bit. Any comments on his style of climbing, Robert? You as an expert mountain climber. You know, he's not looking comfortable, but who would be? <laughs> he's probably on the on the headwind part here, and uh, that's why he's struggling a little bit. You can see the the switchbacks the way up, and uh, at this point, where Zulu he's, he has a tailwind, and uh, Axel Merckx has gone a different way from him. So then he's he's going to be struggling in that part. What sort of gear would they be riding on the big float? Say compared, you know, with yourself, a much lighter person, would there be much difference? There we saw Zulu. He had uh, like probably 42.17, and. Uh, I know when the last time we went up here and uh, I ended up in the group with Rominger, there was an attack by the Gato near the top, and uh, we were on 42.15 for the piece through the tunnel, the little piece through the tunnels there. We were going pretty fast because it, so. it was the same same conditions. There was a tailwind and uh, it was it was very fast. It's it's difficult to deal with that size of gear on a mountain because if you if you lose the wheel then you and it's finished, you'll never come back again. It's not not really a, a climber's hill. It's not really big, little gear stuff. It's uh, it's for somebody strong, and you can see that Jalabert's just sitting there if he's sitting on rollers at the moment. And in the background, the dark, miserable conditions ahead of these riders. The storms that are threatened so far have stayed off. The temperature rather cold. It looks nice and sunny, but they're going further and further up to altitude because they finished uh, today at 1,900 metres above uh, uh, sea level. 
the uh, the highest they've climbed so far 2070 meters we started this morning 370 meters above sea level so they climbed actually something like 1700 meters since the start this morning after rest day uh, on the Barcelona stage uh, on the on the Sunday so they've had a day off but um, they then got to force themselves up not only this climb but we've got uh, more climbs tomorrow and uh, the next day and if anybody's going to ch uh, challenge Jalabert it ought to be today tomorrow or the next day but so far the only man that's challenging him is his own teammate and he's so far down on general classification there's no great threat there just looking for this stage victory for Zula Uh, here comes the group, and it looks like Veronki might be trying to rock it across to Axel Merckx. Merckx has tried to go away. He looks nice and comfy, but the speed of that chasing group, they're coming up in. Della Santa's in there at the moment. Uh, Pistori just behind him. Looks like Bartoli as well. And the ever-present uh, Onse team there. Yes, Veronki is further back down the group. Not looking at all so sprightly for Onk and Pantani, not many dollars. In fact, we have the rumour that Pantani was not even going to uh, bother to go on in the, uh, in the tour after the stage at Lutsadi Den. Yugrimov, who we'd expect also to show in the mountains, has been suffering with the flu, and he's still riding on there at the moment, but um, he's another man who's had his uh, ambitions blunted by having the flu and not feeling so well at the moment. So what's he got to climb right now, Robert? Well, now they're coming up the little piece where we saw the logo under the tunnels and it, it stays the same the same gradient from now uh, for until I think three kilometers from the finish where it gets a little bit flatter normally if you're in the group here you won't be you won't be dropped uh, until, until unless there's a really big acceleration just near the end you can see the slow down a bit because it's like a general recruitment now so uh probably waiting for the next attack to come so look at montai at the back you must have ridden with him several times what sort of climb is he Montoya is more like a climber than, uh, than the other guys that have been well in the race here. He he can ride in a small gear, but uh, he can actually time trial quite time trial quite well too. So he's a useful guy when you get in the break with him. Uh, he can ride really strong. He doesn't tend to to use too big a gear uh, in a normal race. So Garcia on his way now, having a little bit of a go at the front. That chance of taking a second spot on the stage behind Zula, or even pulling Zula back if he moment, if he falters for a moment. The Benesto team, without their team leader Miguel Indrain, who's out, we understand, making very very good progress in his training for the World Championships and probably going on for the hour record as well. Any comments, Robert, on on Indrain not riding his home tour? He's already. I think he's already done what he's had to done for uh, had to do for this year and. Uh he set up objectives to the other objectives. It's hard. It's hard to. It would be hard for him to to come come to the world uh, and not win. And he probably doesn't want want that pressure. Well, um, let's hope we get him here next year. You um, see how difficult it is here, just just for a rider, just to make a make a break from the the pack there. The following week now helping uh, Zilla got inside the final kilometer to go the last time check over three minutes so it looks like he can get this one now the snow capped to Pyrenees in the background these rather unique mountains you always seem to go better in the Pyrenees remember so Clip Robert than, than the Alps what's the subtle difference to, to you or to anybody else is, is there some it's riders more suitable to certain hills than others there's not really a big difference there's the small differences in the, in the road surface and uh, the gradients and things Normally the, the Pyrenees is just a little bit of a rougher road and uh, the hairpins are a little bit steeper. Normally I went there and I was fresher, so uh, that's why I did better. <laughs> now there's Pete Robert Miller, second twice in the Tour of Spain, and uh, knows these roads well, knows this climb extremely well as too, but this man now who's uh, come back from, I would say from the dead, uh, Zula's had more than his fair share of problems in the Tour so far, so I think getting a stage victory is in itself some recompense for the problems he's gone through. He did want to pack up and go home. His team man said, no, ride on, and now he's got a stage victory. He went away after some 87 kilometres being covered with a group of eight men, and one by one they got whittled down until they said the only man left 
at the end of it. He looks quite fresh indeed as the pressure's on behind. It looks like uh, Jalabert is beginning to move forward to the front here and just show his strength. He's done this so often in the race so far that uh, towards the back end, he'll just leave the group he's with. And bear in mind, when we've seen those riders coming up the hill, or the mountain as such, uh, they're the remnants of the 120 riders or so we've got left in this race, and we've been looking at only 20 riders, and they're going to be coming in um, oh, 20, 30, 40 minutes after Zula has finished, and Jalabert looks so comfortable here, looking back at the rest of the riders. And those who may watch our coverage of the stage in Sierra Nevada will know how he romped up there uh, to catch Bert Dietz right on the line. Then, gentlemen, he let him take uh, the victory by half a, half a length as such. But I think he'll take no prisoners today with these two in front of him. It's a brilliant performance, isn't it, uh, Robert? Ah, he's, he's playing with these guys at the moment. It's not, he's, he's one step above all the, all the, the rest of the riders in the race. And uh, he's, he's probably accelerated in the last steep part just to, for, the mount, for the mountain sprint there. And uh, he's, he's took these two, two riders with him. And uh, normally they won't come back because it's like two kilometers now to the finish. And uh, it's, it's like flat a little bit downhill also. And uh, the wind in the back, nobody's going to really chase too hard to catch them. And though present, Artyak riders, Gasha Casas, decides he might as well have a little go, but they seem to get so far down the road and then run a bit out of steam. He's being marked out by Pistori for the Polte team. You can see just the, the difference uh, the Jalabur has made there. He's gone and nobody, nobody's really going to be able to close that gap down now. Well, as Jalabert then riding along and saying that he's now riding with blokes who he can look forward to racing to in the next few years. Just let me tell you of the retirement of one man well, It's coming up at the end of this year, uh, Duke LaSalle, who rode the, uh, uh, at Duisburg over the weekend. He finished in, in second spot uh, behind Tom Covers of the, the Lotto team. He were looking for, for a victory, went away for something like about 100 odd kilometres, and uh, there were three of them, and two Lotto riders himself. So Duke LaSalle, 41 years of age, didn't quite put the lid on his career with a victory on Sunday, but nevertheless uh, went out in the, the, the best possible way by racing and going in a leading break. So we're seeing a whole lot of new riders coming through here. Jalabert riding this race in a very, uh, what I thought, Robert, a very interesting way. He's been prepared to have a go. He hasn't just sat in all the time. He's even looking for the few seconds bonus he can do and prepared to make people like Olano and Verant know that he, he's a boss. I mean, that's we haven't seen quite like that since what uh, Hino and Merckx, I suppose. Yeah, it's good to see somebody with a bit of panache in the race that makes a change from uh, the styles of Indian and Roman who would just sit and wait until the time trial and then basically control the, ra the rest of the race in the mountains. And uh, Jalabert's taken the race to the other guys um, on the days where it mattered, and uh, we've seen the difference that he, that he can make. So that makes it good for your viewers back at home watching on Eurosport this uh, Tour of Spain. First time we've done it every day throughout the whole of the three weeks. Sorry we had a bit of problems coming on air earlier on with the mechanicals of getting the pictures up in the sky, but we've seen Zilla get the stage victory and our cameraman just failed to get second, third and fourth across the line and the big bunch coming thundering in here uh, any moment now. Let's wait because the gap was about three and a half minutes last time. So they come very quickly, and he looks like Veronk then just going through uh, ahead of the story and the slightly downhill uh, finish. I suppose the only reason that uh, they've come and put the finish at this particular spot is because of keeping all the television uh, vehicles and uh, cars for the officials and so on on the particular part where they can, uh, can, can, can park them all. It's not very easy uh, on, on mountains to find a place to put out the massive entourage that travels with the tour. So it looks like Axel Merckx has just come in there. And uh, so he finds himself after five and uh, just over five hours and 13 minutes of racing having difficulty hanging on to that, to that main group. So Jalabert uh, chasing after Zilla. Anse was still showing the enormous strength in this race as Zilla's run out to victor of the stage to Pla La Belle and his teammate galloping in the little group just, just after him. Good afternoon, or as you can see here on the screen, not a very good afternoon for the riders on this stage from uh, Saladou to Lutz Ariden. The 17th stage of the race today, with ahead of them lying snow conditions and uh, the riders starting out here looking back at the start. They were so concerned that, that to begin the uh, stages, they just all stayed. They went very, very slowly indeed and demanded to know of the uh, uh, directorate 
of the uh, race. What on earth the conditions were like over the Tourmalade. They had heard threats of snowstorms and they did not want at this part of the season, with some of them going on to ride the World Championships, to find themselves up the top of the mountain with the snow coming down. So after riding very, very slowly indeed, uh, some of the team managers went along, particularly the team manager of Castle Blanche and Lodo said, look chaps, it's OK on the Tourmalade. Well, I can tell you the clouds are down. Uh, it's not very nice at all, and you can see them here in their uh, winter outfits almost, because they'd be normally expecting perhaps to ride in all this clubber uh, in the start of the season when we've been having, uh, in the previous years, the uh, Tour of Spain taking place in late April, early May. But here we are in September. The sunshine, they've, they've gone from one extreme to the other, these riders. Imagine what it's like. They've been down there, around Sevilla, and down on the coast toward the Sierra Nevada. It was 35 degrees. And just a few days later, they're pitchfork up into the Pyrenees. And here, the temperatures are just above freezing. It's not very nice conditions at all. And you can imagine, with the legs and the... Uh, Muscles all set up uh, for the, uh, the warmer conditions to suddenly find themselves now uh, riding like this. So this is this morning's pictures we have for you because they're having problems getting the uh, uh, feed off the, uh, the first of the, 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 the so second of the climb. We've already had the information about the Aspen climb, but uh, right now the rider's heading up uh, towards the very start of the race. Well, as I say earlier, not very happy indeed, and I'm not surprised either. Uh, the, the riders left the axi are beginning to get whittled down. I have a suspicion that less than half of the field are going to finish. They may be looking rather happy here, but uh, we already had one more retirement. Uh, uh, Pantani uh, decided, and perhaps wisely so, that he would not start today. And so Pantani has retired from the, the field. So the, uh, the, the news then, Pantani's out of the race. We uh, have a quick look at my notes here, how many riders are actually going to start today. But it certainly has been, been thinned down somewhat uh, as a result of the racing we had so far. 121 finished yesterday of the uh, 180 starters. So we're now down 120, so we lost 60 men in all from, from the race. And uh, you can see the conditions here, not at all nice. Well, Robert Willers, start again, Robert Miller's with me. And uh, Robert has had the experience of riding in the Tour of Spain, as I said earlier on, in the April-May period, when the conditions were not dissimilar. In fact, uh, a couple of times they've, they've cancelled stages in recent years because of the snow. Uh, Robert, um, if uh, we can just have a few words from, from you on uh, the conditions, like riding in the racing capes like this, when you've got yourself fully fit, you've been riding in a warm condition, suddenly you find these conditions. What on earth is it like? No, this is a tr this is an atrocious day. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with this at the end of a major stage race because your your body fat will begin down below five percent, so uh, you feel all the changes in temperature, and uh, it looks very cold there. And the guys will be having a a good deal of difficulty trying to adapt to uh, these wet conditions. It's it's not a nice a nice day to ride in the mountains. It's probably not even a nice day to ride anywhere, but from the looks of it. Well, uh, Jalaba yesterday was saying when he went down that short descent before they started the final climb of the day that uh, his hands were getting numb, he's having difficulty uh, applying the brakes and uh, changing gear for the sudden change in condition. Here you can see the one they're worried about, the, the cold, the tourmalade, about uh, how difficult it's going to be over there. They've already been over the Aspen, by the way, that's 1,490 metres above sea level. We haven't got the full result yet. Uh, we just know that Arusta was attacking on that climb. We'll give it to you as soon as it come through to us. But communications have been very difficult indeed. The helicopters are not able to fly. This is one of our fixed cameras bringing you the uh, information when it comes through at the top of the of the cold, the tourmalade. They're due to go over this at uh, uh, Central European time, uh, just around about, uh, what, quarter past uh, three to half past three in that sort of order. So we're only about ten minutes away if they're running on schedule for them for them coming through here. We're waiting for news of them on that on that climb. Not good conditions at all. Certainly, the other thing, Robert, when you get a cloud down, it's surely breathing in all this damp air. That can't be good for you. I know the breathing is not really a problem because you aren't going that fast up the mountain. The big problem is when, when you go over the top here, they call the tourmalade, that there's a number of hairpin bends that you won't be able to see when you're in the cloud cover. So uh, it makes the, it very dangerous for the first uh, four or five kilometers of the descent. It's similar conditions to, I think, in 92 when Cubino won the stage uh, when we rode up tourmalade. The, the conditions were uh, almost uh, the same at the top, and uh, the descent was very dangerous for the first uh, half or so. 
Well, that lies ahead of the riders on uh, the stage when I suppose they wish they could have stayed in bed. And here, this is the picture which awaits them when they finish the stage today, 179 uh, kilometres in all. And uh, they will arrive here, uh, according to the schedule, to finish around about um, how was four or five o'clock. So he's flicking through his notes here. Yes, it's going to be yeah, around about five o'clock all being well, but it could be earlier if they get a move on. But I think somehow today these riders are not too keen about hammering along, particularly with Jalabert with such a substantial lead on the general classification at the moment. Jalabert coming into the stage today with a lead of uh, 5 minutes and 20 seconds on... Uh, sorry, uh, 6 minutes and 18 seconds. He actually punched a hole in the rest of the field yesterday because he, he grabbed himself an extra 8 seconds bonus. And uh, Alano, his nearest, nearest competitor on the overall GC, came in ninth place yesterday and lost some more time on Jalabert as well. So Jalabert at the moment lying in about 6 minutes 18 seconds up uh, his teammate Brunel is in third spot 7.35 Maori 7.49 fourth back from there Bartoli in fifth spot 9.27 and Veron perhaps the only man who would really like to have a gallop in the mountains today is back in uh, in sixth spot 9.57 down Pistori who's wearing the white jersey a second on the mountains climb is at uh, seventh spot 10 minutes and 10 seconds down on the general classification and running down the rest of the top 15 Clavero is eighth Garcia is in ninth spot Garcia Cas Casas of the Artex squad is in the 10th spot. Rodriguez, also the Artec team, is 11th. And Eddie Merckx, his son Axel, after a spirited attempt yesterday to get away on the final climb, is in 12th spot. De La Santa, 13th. Serrano, 14th. Giannetti, 15th spot as we go at this stage today. Well, we're looking down the road now for the riders to come into sight on this uh, climb of the uh, Tourmalet on this the stage uh, from Salad to Lutzada. And this is uh, a look at the riders live. We popped it into the midst of a look back at yesterday's programme for the riders coming up the, the climb. You can see the conditions here. The uh, spectators are getting very numb, and it's going to be also a commentator's nightmare trying to pick out these riders as they come through. Certainly we know that on the climb up here, most of the top men are up there, and they really are coming through what looks more like uh, the conditions for a ghost movie. Over the top there, looks like Veronk there from uh, Jalabert, Rincon in there, the white jersey of Pistori, Alano's over the top as well. And uh, so that is the breakaway group. You can see the clock on the left-hand side showing you that uh, they've gone through now. And on the uh, descent then, the 1.30 then back to the, uh, the group as they're on the way down the descent. Robert, you've been down this climb in somewhat or even worse conditions. What's it like on a bike? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's very steep at the top here. It's a bit like a humpback bridge. And, uh, got to get if you want to put a piece of paper up to protect yourself from the cold or put a race deep on you've got to do it very quickly going over the top because uh, there's a, a right hand hairpin maybe 50 meters after this after the top here and if you don't get it on with them you've got to you're going to be cold for uh, four or five minutes until you get a, another chance to put it on again well they're coming to the Merck now we're going to look back to see if we can identify some of these riders you do the same back at home here they go slow motion as they come through the first lot through the Merck and the gloom that looks to me certainly like Veronk will get confirmation to our commentary point later on. But the Onsays, as ever, willing up on the front of this field to protect the leader's yellow jersey. Now they go through, and that's certainly the yellow jersey of uh, Jalabov. He's reaching down there. It looked like he might have dropped his racing cam. I'm not quite sure about that one. Pistor is going very well there in the white jersey, the Unpulty rider, with the Mape colours. I'm pretty sure that's Alano and De La Santa likewise in there at the moment. Uh, and I'm not certain whether that's uh, Zula just at the back there wiping his glass. Looks like it is. Well, for Zula, this has got to be probably one of the most horrific moments in his life. He falls off when you can see clearly, but for Zula with glasses, Robert, that must be terrible. Yeah, well, the last time we came down here in similar conditions, I was with Zula. And uh, we were all in a group about us, about 10 of us, I think, and, uh, if I remember. And when we went into the club, we were all in a nice little group, and when we came out of the club, the club we were all uh, two, three hundred metres apart, so... Uh, and I remember catching uh, Alex on the just in front of me, and he was so cold that uh, he couldn't break anymore, and he was having great difficulty. And, uh, he didn't enjoy it at all, and he probably have memories of that day again today. <laughs> you said that he also you couldn't see your front wheel. <laughs> what a condition, yeah. right? It was very, very, very scary moments. 
Well, we've just seen Giannetti go to the top then, Mario Giannetti, uh, what, just some three and a half minutes down on the on the leaders. Disappointment, I think, for him, having I mean, come back after that crash, after a very good start to, to the season. But the difficulty is for some of these riders, they're going off to ride the World Championships, they don't want to get coals in their chest and uh, suffer with this one. The, the Tourmalade, by the way, the height here is 2,115 metres above sea level. They, they started the climb at the bottom uh, some 17 kilometres down the road. So you can imagine then how they've come up here. That's over 10 miles of climbing. The, uh, the climb then taking them up to this point way above sea level. It's a tremendously long climb, about 1,200 metres of actual climbing up the climb before they get to the top. And the descent takes them further down to the, the, the bottom of the, uh, the final climb to look side then. They, in fact, descend now like stones right down to the uh, uh, bottom of the, uh, of the foot, the other side of the tourmalade before we start back up to the finish at Lutzard again. So you've come on there, live on Eurosport. Uh, the riders here really have got uh, a, a big problem on their hands. And also, of course, the <laughs> there's a sensible chap, by the way. Yeah, he's, he's, he's thought of uh, what he's going to have to do later, and he's going to stop and put the escape on now while he, before he gets really cold. It must have been very cold on the way up because the, the riders still have their arm warmers on. Normally, you would roll them down and uh, to breathe better on the way up the mountain. Well, that's Bert Dietz, the uh, hit the uh, uh, man who took the stage into Sierra Nevada after that long climb up there. And that was a brilliant performance by him that day. He was away for what, over 100 and odd kilometres, and he just got the stage ahead of uh, uh, Jalabert. We look back then at the leading group coming over. Uh, what, two, four, six, eight, ten murky riders. There could be a dozen or more <laughs> looking through the fog here. And a man holding up his newspapers, but I think they're more happy to take on the racing capes for the descent than just a newspaper to stop up your front just to keep the, the body nice and, uh, and warm. And further back then, more riders stopping. It's uh, probably safe, I think, Robert, with that descent. They're trying to put yeah, on a, a cape. Hmm? It's a lot safer. There's two, two or three hairpins just, just in the start of the descent. And if you don't get, get what you're... Uh, trying to put up your jersey or keep on quick then you're in real trouble for uh, the next four or five kilometers. Well, just imagine this, you viewers. It's the first time you've watched the Tour of Spain. We've had one day when a hurricane can blew him off the bike, so I mean that. Well, Farfan got blown straight in the ditch, otherwise we're burning all over the place. Had to neutralise the race and then restart it further on down the road. Uh, Forty riders got uh, uh, the Tommy trouble with spaghetti bolognese one day. We've had rain, we've had sunshine, we've had heat. I mean, we've had crashes. I mean, this is one of the most incident-packed uh, Tour of Spains that, that I can remember. Although, of course, it always seems to me, Robert, the Tour of Spain always has something happen. It never seems to be a race that goes through smoothly from front to back, eh? That's, that's the great thing about the world. It's the circus every day, and you never really know what you're going to get. And there's always something interesting happens almost every day. You never know what, what it's going to be from, uh, from when you get up to uh, when you go to bed, really. Well, <laughs> and the riders still turn up to riders as well. What are the Spanish spectators like, though? Are they an encouragement? They're, they're probably... There's... It's, it's, it's difficult to explain the difference between the nationalities and the different bike races. Uh, the, the Spanish probably love cycling more than the French do, and the French tend to see it as a seasonal thing. And uh, they get a lot more encouragement in Spain when, they, when the guys turn up. Well, the race is now in Spain. We came through Spain uh, just shortly after the start. We've been on the cold Aspen when Garcia Camacho took that one. Neil Stephen in the second spot, the Chavo is back into, into the third spot. So that was the first climb of the day. They've just gone over the, the Tourmalet. Uh, we're going to take a short break and uh, watch the pictures the best we can do. So we hope that when you come back, we will be watching, I think, yesterday's stage, and then we'll come back with more action live from the Tour of Spain. Do join us then. <laughs> What a day we've got on the Tour of Spain this year. While we've been off air, we've not come back to look at yesterday's programme. We're staying up here because a lot is happening, and if my eyes are, are correct and not by any way uh, confused with the fog that is here, like a, a shot from the Hound of the Baskervilles and Conan Doyle himself writing the script, i sure I saw uh, Al uh, Alex, uh, Axel Merckx go through nine and a half minutes down on the, uh, the leaders. There we've just seen the rider from the Gavis team, Bobrick, go through ten minutes, 18 seconds down, but a lot of people take a real old pasting today. The leading group, about a dozen riders, have gone over the top of the climb, and the result on the top of the uh, uh, turmoil was Vronk first, Jalabert second, Pistori third, Brunel fourth, Maori fifth, uh, uh, Yura in sixth, but Alano was in seventh. We picked out most of those, and now further down the uh, bottom of the climb, we can bring you pictures live, and Robert, you were saying to me that you can find this, you go into cloud, out of cloud, so looks like perhaps 
perhaps, perhaps it might be out of it. Yeah, now they're, 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 they're down below in the ring, so uh, probably got the most dangerous part over. But uh, you can see they're all trying to stay, stay out of the wind here. It'll be very cold now. Uh, Jalabur has no hat, so he won't be laughing much. And the other problem uh, must be the braking. Well, there's not really a problem in Terminal A. There's a lot of big long straights and you don't really need the brakes. It's, uh, but uh, you have to touch them on again just for like to dry them out in case uh, you get some bad bit or, or, or some, uh, some stone or something on the road just in case you've got to like, get out of the way pretty quickly. Well, sorry about the picture breaker, by the way. They're going down a one-way street, I should advise you there. A picture we've just seen at the bottom of the climb. That's normally, if you happen to be going to that village, uh, you actually turn right and go around the village and pop out the other side. But the riders are allowed to go straight through and close the roads, uh, so they go straight through as per the Tour de France. And uh, there's no problem then for the riders to take the back doubles. Uh, see, the leaders have now got that uh, quite sizable lead on, on the chasers. I mean, the one man who's going to look like he's going to drop really out of contention today, Axel Merckx, if my eyes were correct, peering through the gloom, the spotting goes to about nine and a half minutes uh, down, but uh, still they've got a long way to go before the bottom of the climb, and there could be a regroupment before they start the final climb up to Luxardo then, 1,730 metres above sea level, where the conditions, I can tell you, are a little better, but not a lot. So we'll peer through the gloom, our camera, these cameras doing a wonderful job uh, uh, bringing us the pictures. You watch the pictures while I tell you what has happened uh, so far as well. The first print we had today was after 79 kilometres had been covered, and Marcel Vus got that one ahead of Garcia from the Artiac team and Benitez from Kelme, and that was uh, after 97 kilometres at a place called Escala. Uh, then the second of the sprints was before they started the big climbs, was after 95 kilometres at uh, Southern Colin, and uh, at Southern Colin the uh, sprint was run by Uriah, uh, Espinora was uh, second, and Chirato in third. So we're seeing a whole lot of new names on the sprint series. Not that they were galloping very much there. The, the main gallopers in the sprint series have been blasted out by the cold weather, the hard conditions and the climbs. But as far as the classification for the sprints are concerned, no what Vaseman's got to do, he's got 42 points uh, on the in-between sprints ahead of Teutonberg with 18 points and Dolan Jalabo third, is that Vaseman has got to stay inside the time limit today. And that's going to be the big problem from some of these riders. Um, <laughs> some of them might say, thank God I finished outside and go home, but um, uh, Vaseman, who uh, would like to go on, I'm sure, to collect more points and more money in the uh, uh, Meta Volantis competition and to run out the victory and the thing, so he's not going to climb off his bike if he can help it, and we'll try to stay inside the time limit. And what will form at the back is what we know as the bus, and that group of riders who have been shelled out the back. Uh, and I think it was Zula said the other day, uh, Robert, that for the first time in his life he actually rode one of the mountains in the bus, which uh, is normally occupied by the big sprinters, isn't it? Do you ever climb in the bus? Yeah, of course, everybody's been in the bus. <laughs> it's, it's a, you have to be in the bus to appreciate what the, the, the guys who can't really climb go through. Uh, when you're struggling at the same speed that they're used to uh, used to riding that, you can appreciate just just the, the morale they have to, to finish uh, these, uh, these races. It's a very difficult experience to deal with when you're used to climbing great mountains a lot faster, and I think you'll really realize that but it, it happens to everybody, and uh, it's no good having a big head and, uh, about thinking you can climb really, really well, because one day you'll be in the bus like everybody else. Everybody's been in the, uh, Everybody comes down to the, the, the lowest level one day. Well, one thing I've always been uh, surprised about, uh, particularly in the Tour de France, is how the bus works to get just inside the time limit, and you get somebody gets dropped off the back and rides like fury and falls off his bike again, just to continue the next day. You'd think he would use the opportunity not to ride on. I think it's the courage of these riders, all you good people out there listening to the programme, which attracts so many non-cyclists to cycle, and they, they love to see the way that people in the sport will, will, will just massacre themselves to stay on the next day and get massacred yet again. So perhaps you're, we must be massacres then, Robert. But, uh, the the satisfaction of finishing inside the time limit anyway. They're coming down here, a bit on the sharpest side. Bad camera then up here with the leading group at the moment. And whilst we're following on the way down and keeping our fingers crossed for them. Let me confirm the cold aspen. Oops, let me go very gently. Cold aspen then, after 114 kilometres, the first man over there, Garcia Camacho, Neil Stevens second, Chave third, Urusta fourth, uh, 
Linas Perute was in fifth spot, Jalabert six, uh, and Pistoli seven, Zula in eighth, Bartoli ninth. So they're all grouped together in what was then also foggy, cold and rain. And another dangerous descent before they came up the up the Tourmalet, which they're now descending off the Tourmalet. Uh, one man who started to, to attack uh, between the Aspen and the Tourmalet was uh, Dominguez, uh, Dominguez of Kelme. He had a lead of 1 minute and 20 seconds, but uh, he finally got caught on the Tourmalet when a group of some 20 riders started to hammer up there. You saw them come over the top of the climb. They shelled a few out uh, on the top as uh, they went through and came down the other side. Confirmation then again of this group we're looking at here. You'll find Veronk, Jalabert, Pistori, Brunil, uh, Maori, Ura and Alano. And here, Zula, you see that way back in 23rd spot, winner yesterday of the stage. He's back in 23rd because he, he had a bad day on the Sierra Nevada. Not only have a bad day climbing up, but when he came to go down one kilometre down the descent, he swerved to avoid three kiddies crossing the road and crashed for his, what, third time in the, uh, in the Volta. I think he's a chap who comes off quite regularly, though, doesn't he, Robert? Eh? Yeah, unfortunately, he's, he's very unlucky in that respect. In that aspect, uh, he often seems to be in the wrong place at the wrong time in most of, in most of the races. And he's, he's struggling in this group, trying to come back now to the to the front group. They'll probably come back uh, because uh, it looks like uh, only Brunel's doing any work here, just to keep the, the guys happy. Everybody else seems to be content to just to try and stay out of the wind uh, and stay warm. So still on the descent of the Tourmalet, and when they get down the bottom, the agony of the final climb to Lutzardeden lies ahead of this uh, leading group. On this, the 17 stays in uh, from Salado to Lutzardeden, coming 179 kilometres. The riders are now over the top of the uh, the Tourmalet, and ahead of them lies the finish at Lutz Ardiden. Another climb which will take them up uh, way up above sea level, 1,790 metres. And we have this breakaway group here of the riders that went over the top of the Tourmalet. Uh, Veronk won that one ahead of Jalabert. Pistori was third, Brunil fourth, uh, uh, Maori in fifth spot, just showing the strength of the on-sea riders to take uh, uh, first, uh, so, so take second, fourth, and fifth spot. Yurai was sixth, Alana was seventh and uh, Zulov not far behind uh, chasing to try and catch up with them. This is Pistoli we're looking at in the white jersey now and this group really have uh, taken the race by the scruff of the neck and uh, the bad news for the Motorola supporters of Axel Merckx is that he looks like he came over the top of the Tourmalet about nine and a half minutes down on this group. That's my own unconfirmed view of the peer through the fog at the tall figure coming through who started this morning in 12 spot, 12 minutes and 38 seconds down so he'll go down, down, down the general class unless he can really make up some ground on the way through. That's your little breakaway group you're looking at there on the top right-hand corner of your screen. And those are men uh, on the climb of the Tourmalet that really decided they'd start the race uh, in no uncertain terms after they really being uh, riding in a group from the start. It was so cold, so bitter, so miserable at the start. The riders, in fact, threatened to strike. They were going very slowly. They asked what the conditions were like on the Tourmalet because they'd heard there was snow in the air. In fact, it hasn't been snowing, but it's been very, very cold indeed. And so no action really very much until we had that first sprint uh, after the riders went through this uh, 90 kilometer or 79 kilometer point of Escala. Bush took that one, Garcia second, Benitez went third. The next sprint we had before they hit the mountains was at 95 kilometers and there the uh, rider first on the line was Uriah, Espinora second and uh, Gerardo was in uh, third spot. Over the top of the cold Aspin, uh, Garcia Camacho, Neil Stevens, Xavi, Arusta, that was all the top four. Lina Zabaluta was fifth France, Jalabert sixth France, Pistori in the white jersey, right on Jalabert's wheel was seventh, Zula France eighth, and ninth was Bartoli. And that group uh, went over the top of the Aspin after 114 kilometres, and most of those riders are here with us now as we begin to start the final climb up to uh, Lutz Ardiden. So it's been a really a day for the, the strong men today. The information too for those who are Pantanis supporters that Pantani has uh, packed his bags and gone. He decided not to uh, take the, the uh, start today. He's been suffering first of all bronchitis. Now he's got uh, sinusitis and he's leaving on Saturday with the uh, Italian squad for the World Championships in Colombia. Now the regrouping after coming down that mountain and you can see these riders here who've got um, over the top of the climb had a good three and a half minutes lead over these fragmented chasers. So who's going to win this stage? Well, the group is here and if anybody wants to challenge Jalabert from that little group. The only man who really is in with a shout uh, to try and do something about, I think, is uh, Alano, 
who's lying six minutes and uh, can't see on my printed list here, but it looks like six minutes and 18 seconds down on, on Jalabert because uh, the Ante boys won't attack him. Bartoli, uh, Verong could be looking for a stage victory here on this, uh, this climb as well, but um, after yesterday's ride by Zilla, the Ante have showed their enormous strength in the mountains, and I think they're going to defend that uh, jersey of Dallin We are, by the way, in France at the moment, heading up towards Luxardi Den. Another mountain, Robert, which you must be very familiar with? Yes, uh, another very difficult mountain in these conditions. Uh, it's interesting enough, it's where uh, Dakota Walrusen won his first to the French stage, and uh, although not being renowned for being a, a very good climber, he was able to get himself up there pretty quickly. It's not a very difficult climb, uh, but it's, on a day like today, it's, it's going to make a the guys that have led for a lot. And there you can see these hairpin bends looking back down there towards the one kilometre to go uh, for the riders so they come under that one but it twists and turns and one thing about a break where you can look back down and see who else is coming up. This climb then up at Luxardi Den uh, that they're on now they will be climbing for 13.7 kilometres and the actual climb from the bottom to the top they're going 1,030 metres in all so they, that's over 3,000 feet of actual physical climbing to to get to the, the top of the climb, which is 1,730 metres above sea level. So it's a bit shorter than the one up, uh, up the Tourmalet, but as this is the third climb they've had today, the Col Aspen is 1,490 metres above sea level, the Tourmalet 215, uh, sorry, 215 metres above sea level, and Lutzardia 1,730 metres, and all those climbs have come in the final 60 kilometres of the race. That really is a, a, a blow for these riders. Someone must be very tired right now, and we're just giving you on the screens here waiting for the picture to come through the team classification just shows you how strong Ans is but for my money Artiak have shown great courage uh, Mape have not been as perhaps as good as we thought they might be uh, Lotus back in fourth spot that's reasonable and Palti too but the uh, team that's missing off that little list about Bernesto don't seem to have had a lot of firepower although I was taking the other day about the, the aggression in Bernesto and so I said that we had the fight break out Robert I think you saw that fight and you said you knew it was going to win because something with a shoot plates what was that one yeah that, that was it's very interesting to watch that and make use it everywhere uh, the, the thing is uh, that uh, sierra had an advantage because his shoes were flatter than the uh, than ariata so uh, and ariata like have to wear time shoes they're very slippy when you want to fight well, as we're looking back here on the top of the uh, uh, the tourmalade, the, the weather, in fact, has got somewhat better for the later riders. Uh, my watch, I've, I've unfortunately stopped the thing running now, but they must be somewhere around about uh, uh, 15 or maybe uh, 18 minutes down on the leading group. This is a bus that we were talking about earlier in the uh, in the program, and the bus, in fact, has come to a grinding halt here because, sensibly, like the early riders, they decided to put their racing max on here and keep themselves uh, warm on the descent. So. This is the, the sign of the riders at the back, and there the uh, team cars coming to a bit of a halt, the Escudi one, the just behind the motor roller team, they'll be staying with this little group here, and checking, by the way, the, the time gap. I'm going to look to see what the time gap's going to be back from the leaders. They have a percentage time each day uh, back to the, the, the group, and uh, Robert, you must be feeling for these lads at the moment. Yeah, they, they don't look very happy at all. Interestingly enough, they, they're not in a real hurry, which may surprise a lot of people, but they Somebody will, will calculate what, what the time limit is for today and then we'll be riding to try, try and make that for today. Really it's a case of survival for these guys. And they're gonna they're gonna make sure they can stay as warm as they can. They're not racing really anymore and they're just gonna try and survive today. And of course, a lot of those riders we look at in this group, we never see them on, on television because they're always working early part of the race, uh, fetching and carrying and doing all the things they do do. And in a team, Robert, when you're riding with them, I mean, what's, you know, what's your attitude you know, as, a, as a great climber and, and, and the, for the support you get from these sort of fellows? Well, there's maybe a lot of sprinters in this group too, so they're, they're trying to get to get to the Madrid on Sunday and maybe win the stage there. A lot of the guys will also be the workers in the teams and you have to appreciate the, the, the job they do the other days. Everybody's got a job to do in a cycling team, and uh, just because the first riders go over uh, and go over the hill and do well, doesn't mean that you can't do without the help of the other guys in the team. And that's what we're seeing here. The, these are the survivors. And uh, looking at the leaders, uh, with it looks like Veronk at the moment, 
No one of this riders comes here. I've just been checking, in fact, that the average speed today, they look like they're probably running at around about uh, 32 kilometres per hour. And on a 32 kilometres per hour time check, they, they have a 10% uh, time limit on the rider's time to the finish. So when the, the riders cross the line today, they, from back from the first man, they will impose a 10% limit on the uh, uh, on the field, and then they'll start eliminating riders outside there. There are occasions, of course, when... Uh, uh, I'm just looking at the... It varies, of course, on different days, on different uh, stages. I'm just trying to find out which particular one it is today, but that's the sort of uh, uh, time scale we're going to have a look at. Um, yeah, da -da -da -da, this one, in fact, yeah, da -da -da, looks to me like it's... Yeah, looks out of den, uh, the third group, yes, they're going to impose, if you're around about 32 kilometres hour, a 10% uh, time, which seems a bit vicious to me, but we'll see. Uh, in fact, sometimes the team managers can object and get their, their riders back in if they've been caught in misfortune. I would have thought today with the foggy conditions and the rain, they've got every reason to say, look, if my lad's just 2 or 3% outside, you, you should put him back in the race because I think the weather today has been... Uh, well, even worse sometimes it's in the early part of the season. So they're settling down now on this climb. Long old drag up to the top at Lutzardy Dale. Yann de Brunel a également une carte à jouer puisqu'il vise le podium. Il vise peut-être déjà la deuxième place. Well, it's a lovely sight uh, for the spectators, but as far as the riders are concerned, strike a bit of fear in their hearts as a fresh fall and snow up on the top of the mountain. But uh, fortunately, not on the roads. And it takes me, my mind back to the uh, to a city when the, there was an avalanche. And it stopped the race, but I don't think we're going to see that one today. But uh, just keep your fingers crossed for these riders who, as we look back over the Col de Tourmalet, are now on the final climb of the day. Under very, very difficult conditions indeed, the survivors of the race, the leading group at the moment, who are in with a shout of winning this day today, are climbing up uh, to Lutzard Den. Uh, Robert, you've been checking the. Uh, uh, the overall classification, though, only spotted with, with, with one missing, you say? Yeah, we see the guy who's currently fifth on the general classification, Bartoli from Mercatoni. He's missing, so then Richard Viranco will move up one place today if he doesn't crack on this final climb. It doesn't look like he's, he's going to. Uh, he's looking fairly comfortable there. Well, Richard Veronk knows his climb well in the, the tour last year. 94, Richard Veronk won that stage ahead of Marco Pantani. Pantani has uh, uh, now packed his bags and gone home. Uh, because uh, he wants to ride in the World Championships and he was suffering with a sinusitis. Uh, Zula, who won yesterday's stage, is still plugging on to try and get up to that uh, group at the moment. Another man who's in the race today, Pelliccioli, uh, was third in the Tour last year up this particular climb, but uh, hasn't made it to his leading group. That's the man in the centre there, Veronk, who won the stage in the Tour uh, in uh, 1994. Cabino was the man who won the last time he came up in 92 in the uh, Tour of Spain. Sorry about the problems with the pictures, by the way, but uh, we hope we can pick it up for you on the way up this, uh, this climb with a, a good group of riders. Most of the, the top uh, ten are there, except as Robert has spotted Bartoli. And out of the, the top uh, 15 or so on GC, I spotted Axel Merckx struggling further back when on the terminal he looked like being about nine and a half minutes down. Or he's putting the pressure on. This fellow, uh, Robert, to me, has been quite a revelation this year. A new young pro. He's certainly not been afraid to have a go at people, has he? No, he doesn't look like he's afraid of anybody here. He's having a, a good go here, and you can see the, the guys in one line trying to keep, trying to hold, hold him there. And he doesn't uh, look like what I call the, you know, your, your typical uh, mountain climber, either, does he? With all due respect, something like yourself, uh, Robert. Uh, no, how, how tall and how heavy are you, say? I'm only when I'm fit, uh, 58 kilos and uh, for 1 meter 71. But it, the story doesn't look like he's very heavy. He's maybe well, I don't know, 62 kilos or not. He's not at all heavy. But he, look, he looks like a powerful person. So then uh, I think he has a great future ahead of him from what he from what he's been doing here. And the other man who's been able to climb very well that's had the somewhat similar physique to uh, Jalabert to me was, was, was Sean Kelly, who used to be saying, you know, they've been trying to liken uh, Jalabert to uh, Eddie Merckx in the press during this uh, Volta Spani, but I thought with, uh, with with Sean Kelly, who did so well in the Volta over the years, that there must be a similarity between the two in, in, in stockiness and also the ability of, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to win from sprints as well. It's probably a more uh, fair assessment to see that Shella Bears all a lot like Kelly. Mm -hmm. The the styles are very very similar and the, the way they ride, they're very, very canny people. 
Well, if you just tuned on to Eurosport's coverage of the Tour of Spain, we're listening here. My co-commentator Robert Miller was second in 1985 and uh, second in 1986. And that time, 86, Pino won it. Miller was second, and, and Sean Kelly was back in third spot. Sean Kelly won it in 1988, and uh, was also the, the points victor too. So we've had some English-speaking successes in this race in the past. As uh, Zola now trying to claw his way back up that grip, it looks like he's going to make it. He's showing enormous determination here, and of course that will certainly perhaps benefit himself uh, further up the GC, because although this morning Zilla started in 23rd spot, uh, 24 minutes, 47 seconds down, a lot of people ahead of him have now dropped out on this uh, ride of his, so Zilla could find himself climbing back up into the, the top 15 place. It really has been a, a sorting out of the, of the top men today. See another attack there from Pistori, who's he's really, really aggressive in the start of the climb here. It looks like he's feeling really good, and the two guys here are struggling a bit. The, the Gibis rider and the guy from Martiach. So Clavello now dropping back off the pace, and uh, Brignoli from Gibis having trouble. Martiach, as I said earlier on, they're lying what, second on the team classification. They, they really have been a, a very strong team in, in this uh, race. They've got uh, uh, Clavero here lying on general classification overall in, in eighth spot at the moment. And they've got two other riders, uh, Garcia Casas in tenth spot and Olada Rodriguez in, in uh, twelfth spot. So they, they, they really neatly place three riders in, in the top dozen spots. Uh, we don't say see much of, the, of that particular team outside, uh, outside Spain. Like Bears asked, asked Grinnell to meet to set the pace here to stop Pistoria attacking and uh, causing the sudden accelerations. It'd probably be, feel it's beneficial to him and to, to Maori to, to keep the pace at the same level and to, to, uh, to try and keep Pistoria under control a bit. Jalabert will know that Zola is coming back and then if he has another, another rider to ride on the front then he, he'll feel a lot more comfortable with the thing too. See him looking around just to see just to see where Zola is on the slope below. Nine kilometers to go. Zola clawing his way back up to make another great wadge of onset jerseys. who have been so strong in this race. Wrong bobbing about. Must surely be looking for a stage victory to hit here. But Jalabert hasn't missed a beat right the way through this race so far. Ooh. This is a hard situation for Alex Zola to be in. He was just in the cars there, and now he's with that acceleration that Pistori made. The, he's out of the cars again, so he'll be losing his morale a little bit. He won't really know what's happening here. How much of the climbing is psychological, then, Roger? I know your legs have got, uh, Robert. I know your legs have got to do it, but eh? well, in, in that situation, you think you're co you think you're coming back in the, in the front group, and you you have a bit of morale to to hurt yourself a little bit more, and there'll be a sudden acceleration, and you all that hard work you've done, you lose you lose it again. Danger man on the left-hand side, Verant looking for another victory at Lutzada Den. Jalabert looking for another stage victory as well to add to his copious total so far in, uh, in the tour. He, Jalabert took uh, the stage up to uh, Alto Naranco when he rode off the front. He, he got the one to Orense, he got the one to Avila, he got the one in uh, Barcelona when he just showed them his boss were running away off the front. And into Plata Barre, he let his teammate uh, Zula yesterday get the stage. When I say let, Zula was in a breakaway group that went away quite early on in the race. And now Jalabert could be looking for yet another stage victory. But it's a quite useful climbers here as we've seen both uh, uh, Clavero number 11 and 82 the rider from the Gavis team Brignoli just fight their way back in that's a little run down on those riders you can see on the right hand side of your screen and they're quite right Bartoli is not there to be seen we we'll start this morning in fifth spot uh, nine minutes and 23 seconds down Number eight. 
Number 23, that's Garcia for Bernesto. Eight, they roll. 148, Pistori. 101, the far side. Veronk, you can pick out your riders now. see the look on the guys' faces are a very gaunt expression on, on all of their faces. It has to do with uh, how cold they've been on the, on the descent beforehand and they won't really recover until they're back in the hotel and have had a, had a hot shower. All the time that you've been riding, though, Robert, looking at these sort of knee warmer things they got, I think the person I saw do it was uh, Van Hoydonk early in the Tour of Flanders who cut his um, leg, his leg warmers, you know, the whole thing down, so just covered his knees. And the, and the sort of race clothing they're wearing now, and I get the impression there's quite a lot of development in being able to put on clothing that keeps you warm uh, compared with the old days when you know, the woolly jerseys used to, used to get soaked with water and just hang about all over the place. Yeah, quite. Luckily, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of advance with the technology in the, in the race clothing and the, you have a whole lot of different clothes now for different conditions and to, like today with the new warmers they, they really do make a big difference for, for a day like today they keep your knee nice and warm and they don't really uh, hinder your breathing any and make you sweat too much it's, it's a really good thing and also these little things they zip over their shoes now because the old days it's used to fill with water and that was that and your feet went numb too didn't they well once they're filled with water the, the new ones too your feet go numb too so it's really a question of if you want them on your feet or not, there's not really a big difference on a, on a, on a normal day. For a day like today, where you've got a long downhill, it'll stop the wind a little bit, but uh, I would have think the guys would have taken them off for the finish here. Well, the group uh, so far has remained intact since they started on the on the climb here. The uh, just confirmation of the third sprint we had uh, today when uh, Murray went over first, Brunil in second spot, Jalabert in third, and then they went up towards the climb of the So that one sprint just topped, uh, uh, popped in between the two big climbs and this breakaway group that formed on the on the Tourmalet just as they've been riding for some. 134 kilometres, they start to go up there, and over the top they did 144 kilometres, leaving 34 kilometres to go off the top of the Tourmalet. That's when the hammer went down, and this group has been formed. Only Alex Zula is trying to get across them at the moment, and the field really has been fragmented by the pressure. Not going quick, but particularly hard now after what has been a very, very bad day's racing. It started under these conditions, ch uh, chucking it down with rain, and very cold indeed, and when they get to the finish then, uh, they will have covered some 179 kilometres today. Little chasing group, eight to go. Now, Robert, what would you suggest as a way to get rid of this yellow peril? Anyone on this particular climb that's going to be more important than others? Honestly, I can see no way whether they're going to get rid of them. <laughs> Interesting enough, the, uh, the story in the white jersey is, is starting to follow uh, the rank just to try and psych him out a little bit and see how the other guys are, are dealing with this climb. For the moment, the story looks like he's the freshest there. He looks pretty eager and he's probably just waiting for the moment to attack now. This, the pace can't really be too high if, if when we saw the two riders, the one from Kelmi and, and from uh, RTF trying to come back there. They, they may be able to rejoin uh, the back of this group, but I think uh, if the story attacks again, then uh, they'll be lost straight away. Well, Pistori in the white jersey, his first year as a pro, had seven victories last year as an amateur and comes uh, from Monza, in fact, not far from the famous motor racing track. Just some 24 years of age, so he's going to be another useful addition to the, the professional ranks. And it seems that uh, Polti have been very good at uh, picking odd riders up. And uh, we've seen all of this year with people like uh, Giannetti, uh, Uchikov, all being allowed a certain amount of freedom. And it seems that Polti play the, the tactics for like TVM. They allow an individual rider to have a go, particularly since Bunyo's gone away from them. Well, they, they really have no choice. They have no, 
they have no big choice. They have no big um, big star in their team. So then they allow the riders a little bit of uh, movement every day. The riders still grinding their way up the climb to the finish. Up, fortunately, not in the clouds now. The clouds are blown away at Luxardi Den on this, the 17th stage of the race, 179 kilometres today. We're looking at uh, what is left of the 120 starters this morning with seven kilometres to go. One man who just packed his bags and went was Pantani. We were looking forward perhaps to see him climbing in the Pyrenees and looking to see if he get some stage victories in the Tour of Spain to add to those he's had in the Tour of Italy and the Tour de France, but it's not to be. Uh, Pantani, interesting enough, uh, uh, he was sprinting on a couple of days too uh, in this race and in fact he, was, he quoted the press that he was trying out his sprint now would that be a rehearsal for the for the, for the championship but I think strange but with all due respect no sprint uh, the climbers but aren't, aren't very really like sprinters that, that was uh, what would be is, is he thinking he might have a bunch when he gets to the end at Columbia I have no idea what he was thinking there. <laughs> amazing isn't it eh? I, think he was just, I think he probably just went to see what was happening it's, it's interesting to go and look what, what a bunch sprint really like from the sprinter's point of view and I've done it myself when I've been in really good form and it's, uh, it's a different experience but it's not something you'd want to go and do every day if you're a climber when you say difficult experience is it frightening <laughs> yeah you've, you've got to you've got to be really really alert and uh it's not something that most climbers do really do well yeah